in limba romana. Thank you. The one in English is coming up. I just started a little. I just started a little too quick. I invite you all to uh, open your Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, chapter uh, thirteen. We're going to read uh, verses ten through seventeen. Luke chapter 13, beginning with verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could not weigh, could not, and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus has healed her on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered to him and said, Hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years, be loosed from, his, from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. No doubt that all of you and all of us know that we live in an interconnected world. No doubt that all of us realize that things that were impossible 20, 30 years ago today uh, are at our fingertips. And for those of you who are too young to remember, I just want to mention that 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, if you wanted to send an information somewhere across the country or somewhere across the world, you would type it or write it on a piece of paper, you would go and face a fax machine, put it face down, dial a number, and hit send. Not anymore the case, right? Any of you guys in this section remember what a fax machine looks like? No, I thought so. See, today we simply walk up to a computer, or if we don't want to do that, we pull our phone out of our pocket and we start typing and hit send. And it can travel in a matter of seconds across the globe. And all this to help us live in a more connected world, right? We benefit of social platforms to help us be more sociable, correct? To help us be more friendly, perhaps. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, name them. I don't know how many more. But you see, in spite of all this, particularly your generation, the young generation, suffers from the complete opposite of that. Am I right? I was shocked in searching for a few subjects to find out that disappointment and depression is predominant in the young generation and in the last few years has grown exponentially. In a world in which all those theoretically should be extinct, they're nothing else but emphasized and even more with every day that goes by. And there's no doubt that you, all are, you are all aware of 
of events that have occurred here in our backyard in the recent past. And while my desire and goal for tonight's message is not to, not to approach disappointments and, and, and downtimes and depression, if you will, even though I, I really have a hard time going there, because while I'm aware and I acknowledge the fact that there are causes that are outside of our control that can contribute to that, I want us to look tonight in very few minutes from a biblical perspective as of to how to approach these times, as of to how to deal with these instances, because no doubt that the devil is going to try to attack us. No doubt that there's going to be arrows thrown in us, uh, thrown at us to, to, to hit us. But I want us to look in the Word of God, and particularly in this passage, and one more passage that I'm going to touch upon heavily tonight, to see what our stance should be, to see what our approach should be, to see what the Word of God teaches us to know and to understand and how to live and how to go through those times. Because the, near fact that, the, the mere fact that we're Christians it doesn't mean that we won't face trouble. It doesn't mean that we won't, first advers won't face adversities. But it means that in those troubles and in those adversities, as the psalmist said in Psalm 23, even though I may walk through the shadow of the valley of death, there's a promise there. And that promise is that we don't walk alone. The promise is that we're not relying on ourselves or on, or on our own understanding, but rather we should rely on the Word of God. And the better understanding that we have of the Word of God, the better chance of success in those situations we have. The more that we rely upon the Word of God, the more we'll be successful going through it or identify it when it comes our way. And very quickly, I want us to look in tonight's reading and look at four things that we can understand and we can apply from this text. First and foremost, in a message entitled, Not Alone and Never Forgotten, we have to understand tonight that even if Jesus, even if God seems to be busy, He is always available. Even if it seems that He is busy when we pray or when we need Him, perhaps in that very moment, never doubt that He is always available. Verse, 11, verse 10 says, Now He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Let me remind you that the Sabbath was a very special day back then, that it was honored as such and treated as such. Furthermore, it says that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. We'll see later on in the synagogue there were somewhat important people. The leader of the synagogue makes an appearance in our text tonight. And so when he was teaching, that was an important thing to do. But even if he seems to be busy, the Word of God reminds us tonight that he is always, always, always available. I talk to people about Jesus, and I talk to them about what he has done and what he does. And when we get to the part that he is all-knowing and omnipresent. It's a concept that it's hard for them to understand. I've had people who told me, Benny, I, I'm not important enough for God to, 
to, to care about me. Uh, God has a lot more important things to do. There are crucial things that happen in this world, uh, wars and, 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 and major decisions that, that, that affects the balance of power at times. Maybe he is concerned about those. Maybe he, maybe he cares about those, but me and what I do and, 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 and me just a simple person... Let me tell you, friends, and remind us, brothers and sisters, tonight, that even if he has all these other things, and we know that he's all-knowing, and nothing happens without him knowing, he holds the universe, he created us and everything around us, he is never, never too busy. He is always available Allow me to go through Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3, and the Word of God says, But now, thus says the Lord, listen, who created you? He formed you, O Israel, fear, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Verse 3 concludes, I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. You see... Every time you're going to be attacked with that thought that God is too busy, I want you to remember and come back to the Word of God and remember that He's always available. You are created, and I am created, and we are created in His own image. The Word that we read said, He who created you. He invests, we are created and we, we have the breath of life from him. He says, I have formed you. You are the crown jewel of his creation. He says, you are mine. You are priceless. He says, I gave nations for you. Do you think that he'd be too busy to know about us? He'd be too busy to care about us? Not at all. Not at all. The more we remember that, the more we come back to the basics of the Word of God, the more encouraged we will be in times of trials. First and foremost, friends, beloved brothers and sisters, remember that even, even if we have that thought at times that he seems too busy, he is always, always available. Second, verses 11, we can understand that even if we think that our burden is unbearable, Jesus knows everything about it. Verse 11 says, And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Raise your hand if you're 18 or under. Up high. Think of your life up until now. Think of the experiences that you've been through. This woman had suffered for 18 years. Do you think that was a heavy burden to carry? Do you think that was a long time to carry it? You see, at times we may be tempted to say our burden is unbearable. I want to go with you to an example in the Old Testament which I told you I'm going to touch upon. Because I was surprised to find out that a lot of times this text and this passage is used to, to justify depression. And I want to touch upon Elijah's situation. We know about him that at a point in his life, King Ahab was looking for him in every corner and everywhere possible. 
We know about him that at a point he met Obadiah and he said, go to the king and tell him that we're going to meet. They went to the mount and he stood in front of a king who could have simply said a word and Elijah would have been done. But he stood in front of 450 false prophets And when they prayed a whole day for fire to light up the offering, nothing has happened. And the Bible says that at the end of the day, at sundown, Elijah prayed. And he prayed, God of Abraham, Jacob, and Israel. Two things. Let it be known today in Israel that you are God. And that I am your servant. After this episode, he prays for rain after three and a half years. And as we heard this morning, and it was so nicely put in front of us, he didn't give up. He didn't give up after the first try, second, third, all the way to the seventh. And after he does all this, Jezebel says, that's it. Tomorrow by noon, your life is going to be done. And no doubt, Elijah runs for his life. And after serving God and after being there and after seeing all the miracles that God has done for his people, Elijah gets to a point and, and he says, Lord, why all this? Lord, Take my life. He never thought to take his own life. He said, Lord, take my life for I look at myself. I am no better than my parents. And James says that he was a man just like you and I. And wouldn't you be tempted to think like that at times? But nowhere in the Bible, Elijah acted upon that. No, no. As a matter of fact, God comes to him and he says, Elijah, you know what? I have a lot of other people like you. I have people who haven't knelt down, who didn't kneel down in front of Baal, whose mouth, mouth have nev has never kissed them or their statue or the idols. And may I remind you that Elijah's mission wasn't done. As a matter of fact, after this, he meets Elisha, who becomes his disciple. You see, the temptation at times is to say, God, this is too much. I can't carry no more. And I agree with you. But I want to go to the Bible and I want to go to the Word of God in Matthew 11, 28, 30. Jesus' words, listen to this. Come to me, all, who you, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Listen, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is, say it. Light. The world's burden can't be heavy. I agree with you. And the reason why that is is because you don't see a way out. Because we don't rely on the one that we should rely upon. It could be heavy. But there's an alternative to that. There's a burden that is light. There's a yoke that we can carry. Because the word of God promises that we don't carry it alone. And we don't carry it on our own strength. Remember, even if you think the burden is unbearable, Jesus knows everything about it. Third, even if you're just part of the crowd... Jesus sees you and stops to talk to you. 
Verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Let me ask you. Do we see or do we find this woman screaming or yelling for Jesus' attention? She was simply in the synagogue or in the place where Jesus was. And the Bible says that Jesus saw her and called her personally to him. He looked at her. He called her and he talked to her. I want to remind you another example out of the Gospel of John, chapter 5. It was mentioned to us recently. It says that in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there was a pool called Bethesda. This pool had five porches that were used to access that water. The Bible says that around this body of water, around this pool, there was a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And they were there for a single motive. It said that at a given time, an angel would come down, stir up the water. And whoever was the first one to go in would be completely healed. Imagine this. Blind people who couldn't see this happening. And they would simply listen to hear if the water was stirred to say, maybe it's my chance to go in and be the first one. Imagine paralyzed people who are sitting at the edge, seeing the action happen and then getting in and being healed. The Bible says that amongst this multitude of people, there was a man there, a man who had an infirmity for 38 years. Should I ask to raise your hands if you're under 38? I won't because I don't qualify. 38 years. And Jesus walks in this place. Do you know what happens? There's a multitude of people. But Jesus has his eyes set on one. And when he sees them, the Bible says, Jesus asks him somewhat of a rhetorical question. And he says, do you want to be healed? Friends, beloved, youth, remember, even if you think that you're just part of the crowd, Jesus sees you and stops and talks to you personally. There are many ways that he can do that. There are many ways that he does that. He does that through the Word of God. He does that through songs. He does that through an encouragement. He does that through a person who you may least expect it. But he does it. Because he can. Isaiah 49, 15. The Word of God says, Can a woman forget her nursing child? And not have compassion on the son of her womb? And the word of God answers and says, surely they may forget. It might happen as, as, as impossible as it will seem for us. We live in a world where we know that is possible. We see it happen. Do you know what God says following this? Listen. Yet... I will not forget you. That's a promise of the Word of God. That's a promise that we can stand upon. And we can remember that He has promised that He will never leave us. Never forsake us. As a matter of fact, in Matthew, at the end of Matthew, He says, Go and, 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 and spread the gospel, for I will be with you now until the end of the days. That's a promise. 
But you see, we fall prey to these attacks a lot of times again because we have a tendency to rely on earthly things or on earthly techniques to solve problems when in reality and in essence, we should always come back to the Word of God. We should always rest upon its promises. We should always rely on its promises and take them to heart. As I mentioned before, if the Word of God says, and it does, that even though we might, we might and we will go through troubles, we will experience pain, we will experience suffering because we're humans. But yet if we remember in those times and before those times, we lay a solid foundation that will allow us to remember that in those times God is with us. We will go through them more than victorious. Fourth and last, and I want to close with this. Even if everyone seems against you, Jesus will always, always stand up for you. Look at what happens in this passage. The leader of the synagogue, the ruler of the synagogue, Answered with indignation. And he says, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. Friends, beloved, I want to remind us tonight that even when everyone, even when everybody, and let me say this, even when at times those closest to us seem to be against us, remember that Jesus will always stand up for us. Look at what Jesus does. Lord answered to him and said, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? A less significant thing happened or, or, or something that's routine happened and you're frustrated because a miracle of God has happened. Remember, even... If people seem to be against us, even if friends, close ones, seem to be against us, even if the world is and seems to be against us, there's somebody that will stand for us every time, and that's Jesus. Psalm 37 verse 28 says, For the Lord loves justice. And does not forsake his saints. Memorize that. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. Because he has promised us. He has promised you, I, and each and every one of us here. That he is always and will be always with us. And the proclamation that, proclamation that we always make based on the word of God. That that who is in us is stronger than what's in the world. We ought to believe that. We ought to live that. It doesn't mean that if we're Christians we're not going to be susceptible. Or, or, or we're going to be completely shielded. No. We will go through those times. But our approach, our attitude, our view, our life, and the way we go through those and we face those ought to be completely different than the world. It ought to be with hope. It ought to be with faith. And it ought to be with complete 
and total trust in God, for he has never failed, and he never will, never will. Remember those things. Take them to heart. Let us become Christians truly, truly with a solid foundation that we may be a light in this world and to those around us. May as such help us, God. Amen.